very much. It's a great pleasure to address this audience. Um, my remit today is to deal with uh, the issue of how important is organ sparing surgery in rectal cancer and how can we progress it. And before embarking on organ preservation, I thought it'd be useful just to reflect on the last few generations of uh, how we have worked to improve our outcomes in rectal cancer surgery with radical excision. We can see that over this time, this is a cartoon history of 150 years of rectal cancer surgery, we've seen a dramatic reduction in mortality. Mortality rate for radical surgery should now be less than 5%. Local recurrence should be achievable at uh, levels of uh, less than 10%, ideally 5%. The number of patients who are dead at five years from diagnosis has reduced steadily over, over the years. And the number of patients who end up with a permanent stoma has fallen, but it's still around 40%. But the area where we're really failing to make impact is on major morbidity from radical surgery for rectal cancer treatment. We are curing the disease, but at considerable cost. And this major morbidity is really shocking. It's life-changing. It's life-ruining. Um, we are subjecting patients to mutilating surgery, which, if it goes badly, if it goes wrong, it goes badly wrong. These patients may end up for months in, in hospital. Many of them will never regain fitness again. Our permanent stoma rate is around 40%. So that includes those with colostomies, but also those who have defunctioning ileostomies where they are never closed. That has an impact on patients' uh, quality of life, but also cost, around two to 3,000 euros per year. Many of our patients end up with fecal leakage and incontinence, urinary incontinence, and sexual dysfunction. And they're really never quite the same again. So how important is it to try and have a mode of treatment that, that spares the rectum? Well, it's so important that one patient uh, wrote a book on how he wanted to save his own bottom. How are we going to pre 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 progress that? What do we have to offer? Well, when we're considering the treatment of rectal cancer, we do, of course, think about the primary tumour. We think about nodal disease and we think about metastatic disease and we have to put that in the context of what's the patient like that we're dealing with. Now this sort of tumour is unlikely to be suitable for organ preservation. But this sort of tumour is highly suitable for organ preservation where there is a localised tumour with no lymph node involvement. And indeed this extra levator abdominal perineal resection will cure that small tumour it will produce a fantastic specimen that the pathologist will be able to feed back wonderfully. But you know, it ends up with a patient who says, I would rather avoid this sort of treatment. It's not what I want to have. So what can we do to progress it? Well, we've already heard that there's a, a, a complete response, if you like, incidental complete response to those tumours which are uh, 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 not intrinsically suitable for local excision. But the groups I really want to discuss are those who are uh, suitable for primary treatment by local excision and those where local excision may be con uh, uh, combined with some form of neoadjuvant or adjuvant treatment. When we look at these small tumours with no lymphatic involvement, it's potentially possible to cure these just with uh, removal of the primary tumour, leaving the organ in place. Now, the downside there is that we are leaving the lymph nodes involved, and although preoperative imaging may reassure us that they're not involved, of course, there may be occult disease, and if the lymph nodes have occult disease, that patient will inevitably develop recurrence. Now, we undertake this local excision by many approaches, but this is a, a, a transient endoscopic microsurgery. It really amounts to doing laparoscopy inside the rectum through the anus. It's a stable platform, gives a very good view of the, um, of the, of the tumour and offers very precise techniques for excising the tumour. It's generally done under uh, general anaesthetic. Patients are in for one or two days. The complication rate is low, 5 to 15% reported minor complication rate. Major complication rates are around 3%, and that compares to, as we've said, 40 to 50% in radical surgery. But as a measure, only about 1% of these patients will end up with a stoma to handle this, this type of complication, and the mortality rate is less than 
patients make a good functional recovery, even when in this example we've gone into the peritoneal cavity, we can achieve closure. And as we see in the graph on the right, most patients will return to normal quality of life within three to six months after TEM surgery. This is how it goes together. It's not appealing. It looks like some terrible accidents happened. We've got this minimalist version. We've got the robotic version for those who can't operate. Somewhere in here there's a, an anus. And we've got our cost-cutting variant. And I show these really to say what's important isn't, the tech, is, isn't how you do it. What's important is that we end up with a good quality specimen of full thickness uh, rectal wall with uh, a good clearance around the tumor. So what's the evidence that this is of any value? Well, if we adhere to some fairly strict criteria, if we, if, we, if we confine our surgery to T1 tumors, if we make sure they're small, we make sure we remove them completely and we avoid undifferentiated tumors in those with lymphovascular invasion, then that can translate through to a local recurrence-free survival of 90%. It's not 100%, but it's giving patients a chance to have cure without the, the cost of uh, quality of life deterioration. If we get it wrong and we drift towards those more advanced tumors, the less favorable features, then of course the local recurrence rate will increase. That local recurrence rate really uh, reflects the evolution of occult lymph node disease. Now we can work out the, 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 the risk of lymph node involvement in local recurrence by quite simple means. We can look at the size of the tumor, the depth of invasion, and the presence or absence of lymphatic invasion. And with that, it gives us a good idea of risk. Now, it's a good idea that informs the, 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 the consultation with the patient, but of course, it's not an absolute risk. What is useful is that if we have a patient where the risk is unacceptable, let's say it's a 25% risk of, of lymph node disease, then we can offer them, after local excision, we can offer radical surgery. And the consequence of that radical surgery is that we return their risk of local recurrence and indeed their risk of cure to exactly that which it would have been if they'd had radical surgery in the first instance. So these patients, oncologically, do not lose out by having a local excision first. But what are the downsides? Well, the downsides were largely highlighted in publications from around 10 to 15 years ago, mainly from North America. And this example from Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, is, 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 is a, a reasonable case. We, we have, um, they reported on around 90 patients with uh, treated with local excision for T1 and T2 tumors. And not surprisingly, the local recurrence rates are shown here. The local recurrence free survival is around 80%. It is going to be that because the lymph nodes are left in place. But what was terrible uh, was the consequence in those 20% of patients who suffered local recurrence. Now, this population were not uh, surveyed with any follow-up. They presented when they had further symptoms. And a proportion of those with recurrent disease were able to have surgical resection. But, of course, this was exentative surgery, extra anatomical excisions with uh, a very high positive margin rate. And the consequence is that the development of recurrent disease after local excision was pretty much a death sentence. But we have to reflect on those data because although that information really curtailed the practice of local excision for rectal cancer treatment, we've got to remember that 70 to 80% of these patients actually survived without recurrence and were saved the consequence of radical surgery. And it does raise the question of, if we had surveyed that population more closely, would we have been able to detect that recurrent cancer at an earlier stage where it could be rescued? Now, the hint that that's the case is starting to evolve, and this paper still remains one of the uh, most useful. It comes from a Dutch group with a huge experience in, in local excision. Now, this isn't a randomized study, but they took 76 T1 cancers who'd been treated without radiotherapy as part of the Dutch TME trial. And they compared them with what ended up as a group of 80 patients um, who were treated with local excision. And this group were followed up according to the Dutch colorectal cancer protocol with regular uh, endoscop endoscopic assessment and ultrasound. And what they found was, not surprisingly, those who had radical surgery did not have local recurrence. This is, after all, T1 disease. But those who had local excision had a recurrence rate of around 20%. We're not going to get rid of that. It's the evolving lymph node disease. But when they looked at survival in these populations, they found that there was no difference. And when they looked, teased through the data to those who had isolated local recurrence, 
They were detecting it at an early stage. Um, exentative surgery was not required. All patients were treated with total mesorectal excision. Only one case had an involved margin. And overall, local recurrence did not impact on uh, uh, the, the uh, survival or, or d did not result in death in this population. So it would appear that if we have a, a well-organized strategy to approach surveillance, and in our practice it's three to six monthly MRI with endoscopic, endoscopic assessment around the same period, then we, we, we are expecting that we'll pick up this disease at an early stage. How long does it have to go on for? Probably a great deal of time, perhaps even as long as 10 years. Now, what can we do to extend this population? Because clearly that's quite a small population of patients who may be treated by local excision alone. The idea of giving neoadjuvant treatment followed by local excision is not a new one. Um, the Gerald Marks published this in 1990, and it reflected really 20 years of practice of using high-dose uh, radiotherapy followed by local excision. More modern practice is shown here from Lizocchi, who has a huge local excision practice in Rome. And they, they, they describe the results. Again, this is non-randomized data, but they describe the results of T1, T2 cancers, N0, who were treated primarily with chemoradiation. So that's quite controversial in itself. They were reassessed following chemoradiation, and a proportion, 35, proceeded to local excision by 10. The remainder, 35, had radical surgery by laparoscopic anterior resection. And there's a few interesting points. The first is that the complete pathological response rate was about 30% quite different from the 12 to 15 percent we'd see in advanced disease. The second is that the overall outcomes were, showed no difference in uh, survival. So this is just a clue that, although there's selection bias in here, it's just an indication that if we, if we use chemoradiation and local excision, we can offer patients the cha same chance of survival, but without the downside of radical surgery. Now, this clearly needs to be tested, and at present there's a TREC trial in the UK which looks to randomise patients to um, short course radiotherapy with a delay and local excision versus radical surgery. A similar trial is underway in the Netherlands, a CART study. Um, it's more of a tailored approach where patients are treated with chemoradiotherapy and then the, the, the response is assessed and um, they are offered either local excision or radical surgery with a number of criteria. Uh, that will determine if those with local excision then have rescue surgery. Now, the other approach is where we have a tumour that's removed by local excision, and then when we assess the post-10 pathology, we find that the risk of recurrent disease or lymph node involvement is unacceptably high. Now, I've already pointed out that these patients can be offered completion surgery, and their oncological status is preserved, i.e. They, they should be at no greater risk of recurrence. But many of these patients would not wish to have uh, 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 completion uh, surgery. So for those who are at low risk, we'd keep them under observation. Those at high risk, we'd try to convince them to have completion surgery. But this intermediate risk group are quite difficult. So this is perhaps those with a 15 to 25 or even 30 percent chance of local recurrence. Now, there are some data out there to suggest, and it's really no more than anecdotal, to suggest that if we undertake uh, local excision by TEM, uh, with clear margins and offer them radiotherapy, we may be able to reduce the recurrence rate. This is one paper from uh, Israel that uh, reports no local recurrence in 12 patients treated with radiotherapy after 10 versus uh, two episodes of local recurrence in the four who were not treated with radiotherapy. As I say, it's anecdote, but it gives a, a flavor that there may be something in it. So if we look at this intermediate risk group, we propose a trial where we will assess them as intermediate risk and they'd be randomized to chemoradiation versus completion uh, uh, TME surgery, which of course is gold standard. Interestingly, our uh, um, um, outcomes there are, are, are flipped to most oncology trials because we're looking at quality of life. We want to, we want to compare treatment-related morbidity and complications, stoma-free survival, and right down at number four is disease-free survival. But of course, on the basis of the data that's available so far, we would expect the, the survival to be equivalent. So to summarize our route to increasing organ preservation, we have to have better selection of, of low-risk cancers for treatment by, primary, uh, by uh, local excision.
For those that may be slightly increased risk, then we have to think about approaches through TREK and the CAT study that are going to look to expand the population with neoadjuvant treatment before local excision. We have to get better at uh, assessing uh, the, 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 the risk of recurrence post-TEM post, uh, excision, so our assessment of the TEM specimen. That currently is by histological means, but it may be that we'll have molecular profiling to, to guide us in the future. And for those patients who have found to have a, a risk of local recurrence that is unacceptable, then we'll have recourse perhaps to uh, chemoradiation versus uh, uh, radical surgery. And finally, we have to have very rigorous post-operative surveillance with MRI. Um, I think these patients can be rescued with uh, early completion surgery if, uh, if any abnormality is detected on MRI. Now, what that does is it makes the treatment of the spectrum of early stage cancer very, very complex. We were able to cure patients. It was quite simple, but we caused a lot of harm. And to flip it such that we are able to cure patients and cause less harm, we can have this really quite complicated approach. The aim of it all, of course, is to try and uh, keep these uh, little old ladies and sometimes not so old people intact and avoid the, the downsides of, of radical surgery. Thanks very much. <laughs>